the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals issued a ruling on Friday that grants a victory to Nicholas Merriweather, who is a Christian professor who was challenging the use of gender pronouns. What the heck are we talking about here? This story is an interesting one. It comes over from lawandcrime.com. Once again, the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals on Friday ruled in favor of somebody they call a devout Christian, a professor who was disciplined because he refused to refer to students by their preferred pronouns after a 2016 directive at a small state university in Ohio ordered him to do so. So this guy's a professor. He is teaching at a university called the Shawnee State University. He's been there for 25 years. He taught courses in philosophy, religion, ethics, and the history of Christian thought. Court of Appeals on Friday found in favor of him. He was disciplined because he did not call students by their, quote, preferred pronouns. Interesting case. The court held that university officials in a lower federal district court failed to recognize the professor's First Amendment rights. So it's a, it's a free speech case to free speech and the free exercise of his religion. By so holding, the court decried the notion that the university, quote, might wield alarming power to compel ideological conformity. So you have a federal court of appeals basically backhanding a smaller university saying, you look like you're, you're sort of trending towards compelling ideological conformity with some of your rules. That's a violation of the First Amendment, your right to free exercise of your religion and your right to free speech. The professor, Nicholas Merriweather, strives to live out his faith each day. The Sixth Circuit opinion reads, as such, his religious convictions influence how he thinks about human nature, marriage, gender, sexuality, morality, politics, and social issues. Merriweather believes that God created human beings as either male or female, and that sex is fixed in each person from the moment of conception, and that it cannot be changed regardless of an individual's feelings or desires. According to the Sixth Circuit, the university directive said that any professor who refused to use a pronoun that reflects the student's self-asserted gender identity would face discipline. When Merriweather questioned officials about what role his own beliefs played in what he was allowed to say, he was told he must call students what they wish to be called, regardless of his own convictions or views on the subject. Got a professor, says I'm very religious. I teach history of Christian thought. I teach philosophy. I teach ethics. I teach religion. And my religion tells me God created two genders, human beings, born, man and women, male and female. School, college, university says you have to call people by whatever they want to be called. He says, but that goes against my religion. They say that's too damn bad. You must call them what they want to be called, regardless of your own convictions or views on the subjects. Merriweather says, uh, the school said, by forbidding Merriweather from describing his views on gender, even in his syllabus, he silenced a viewpoint that could have catalyzed a robust and insightful in-class discussion, said the court. So he couldn't even mention this on the syllabus, which they are looking to as a bummer because they could have talked about it. Court described Meriwether's superior, Jennifer Polly, as derisive and scornful, which sounds like somebody in academics, in, academ in academia. According to the court record, Paul told Meriwether that, quote, Christians are primarily motivated out of fear and, quote, should be banned from teaching courses regarding that religion. <laughs> Jennifer Polly says that Christians should be banned from teaching about Christianity. <laughs> All right. So through the university's policy, though the university's policy was announced in 2016, Meriwether trouble started later in January. I can't get over this. January 2018, he referred to a student known in the opinion only as Jane Doe as sir. So, so this professor, he's going through class. Somebody raises their hand. Sir. That's illegal. <laughs> That's because he's Christian and, cre and Christians uh, are primarily motivated out of fear. So that addressing, you know, sir, was just totally unacceptable. Reprehensible conduct, actually. We're going we're gonna to dive into it. No one at the time, no one would have assumed that Doe was female based on Doe's outward appearances. So he says, sir, nobody would have known that that was not a sir. That she, was, that, that, that she was, in fact, female based upon his outward appearances. That didn't last long. The student who continued to attend class complained again. University told Meriwether that he would be forced to call the student a female. 
says the court opinion. University refused to allow Merriweather to place a disclaimer in his syllabus, which stated that he would only refer to students by their preferred pronouns under compulsion. So this guy's got an attitude and I love it. So he wanted to add into his syllabus, hey, I'm going to call you by your gender preferred pronouns. We have this policy here at our uh, university, woke you, that says, I got to call you by your gender by your preferred pronouns. No problem. I'm going to do it, but I'm only doing it because I'm under compulsion. And it's not, <laughs> it's not, it's not, it's in violation of my religion, but because I'm being compelled to do this, he wants to put it in the syllable. And he wants to add in a disclaimer it says setting forth his personal and religious beliefs about gender identity. The college college rubbish that suggestion is a violation of its gender identity policy. So he wanted to say, I, I, I'll call you that under compulsion and I'm going to detail my religious beliefs. But the college said, nope, got to get that out of your syllabus. Meriwether continued calling the student by her last name. He slipped up once but corrected himself. The student remained in class and received, quote, a high grade for very good work and frequent participation in class discussions. The same student complained again. College initiated what the Sixth Circuit referred to as a less than thorough investigation. Quote, aside from Doe and Meriwether themselves, none of the witnesses testified about a single interaction between the two. So you have a very, uh, very, very upset uh, student, female student, unhappy that they got, got called sir. Nobody really can even talk about it. No witnesses even came in and testified about it. But one student complained a number of times, and this is what happened. Meriwether was never discharged, nor was his pay cut. He sued because he feared those actions were imminent. Good move. Reprimand letter in his file would also make it difficult for him to obtain employment elsewhere, he said. His case alleged violations of free speech, free exercise clause of the First Amendment, due process and equal protection clauses of the 14th Amendment, the Ohio Constitution, and his contract with the university. Student known as Jane Doe and an organization known as Sexuality and Gender Acceptance intervened. Federal judge recommended throwing the case out. So the, the, the professor sued. He's the one who brought the claim. And the gender acceptance and sexuality people, they, they got involved and the court tossed the case. Federal district court agreed. Sixth Circuit flipped the matter and sent it back. Resulting appeals court opinion in Meriwether versus Hartop was written by Judge Amul Thapar, a Donald Trump appointee, Federalist Society contributor, senior judge, George W. Bush appointee, and Joan Larson, another Trump appointee, were the two judges on the three-judge panel. And so uh, this is sort of a, a small ruling. We're going to see if the whole court hears it. But right now, this is a victory for this professor. Judges held that the district court botched the law when it decided that Meriwether was not protected by the First Amendment while teaching in the classroom. So the district court said, no, you don't. What are you talking about? You don't have the First Amendment in your in your class. You don't have free exercise of religion when you're in your classroom. OK, you're there as a professor. You got to go teach the kids. Your religion be damned. Leave that at the door. Come in here. Call people whatever the hell they want to be called. Sixth Circuit said, no, that's not the case. That's not how it works. District court. It's a little bit more robust than that, the First Amendment. So let's take a look at this opinion. We see here that this one was uh, submitted here for the Sixth Circuit. Recommended for publication. We got Nicholas Merriweather, who's the professor suing Francesca Hartop. Watson, Williams. We've got uh, uh, trustees of the Shawnee State University. Then we've got uh, other people in their official capacities. We also have intervenors from the sexuality and gender acceptance. This is appeal from the U.S. District Court, so a lower level court out of Ohio, argued November 19th last year, decided a couple days ago, March 26, 2021. We see the attorneys down here listed, circuit judges, a lot of other attorneys, a lot of attorneys involved. National Center for Lesbian Rights. We've got, who else? A lot of law firms, Alliance Defending Freedom, Kidd and Erling Law Firms, Independence Law Center, University of Notre Dame, We've got Billings Law Firm, Arizona's in here making the list. Okay, so let's go into the opinion, see if we can break this down. Circuit Judge, traditionally, this is from the uh, uh, Donald Trump appointed judge, Circuit Judge Thapar. Traditionally, American universities have been beacons of intellectual diversity and academic freedom. Not when I was there. They have prided themselves on being forums while controversial ideas are discussed and debated. They have tried not to stifle debate by picking sides, but Shawnee State chose a different route. It punished a professor for his speech on a hotly contested issue, and it did so despite constitutional protections afforded 
by the First Amendment. The district court dismissed the professor's free speech and free exercise claims. We see things differently. We reverse. District court decided this case on a motion to dismiss. So we're going to review this in a light most favorable to the plaintiff, which means the, the professor sued. Defense filed a motion for uh, a motion to dismiss. The court granted that. So they're going to revisit that and they're going to say, all right, now let's take this. It got dismissed against the professor. Let's review it. And we're going to look at it in a light most favorable to the professor because they just got shafted. So we're going to review it from their end. This means that we must accept the complaint's factual allegations as true and draw all reasonable inferences in Meriwether's favor. So they're looking at it from his point of view. Under this standard, we must reverse the district court's dismissal unless it appears beyond doubt that the plaintiff can prove no set of facts in support of his claim would entitle him to relief. So they're going to review it. They're going to look at everything that's true for Meriwether because the case was dismissed. It wasn't even heard on the merits. It was just dismissed. The judge just said, no, get it out of here, right? They're going to they're gonna review it in a light most favorable to the person who had the case dismissed against them. Meriwether continued to teach students without incident until 2018. On the first day of class, he was using the Socratic method to lead discussion in his course on political philosophy. And the Socratic method is something that you use in law school. I mean, I had most of my classes were in the Socratic method. It's questions, just asking questions. So in law school, it's kind of stupid, but this is just how they do it. You know, they don't actually really teach you much of anything. You kind of have to learn a lot of that stuff on your own, but they help you work through it. So they'll, they'll tell you to read a case or a couple cases. You'll read them. You'll, you'll learn almost nothing because you don't know the law. You kind of are kind of piecing it together. I mean, they make it really difficult rather than just going in and saying, hey, look, we're going to do math today. Uh, two plus two equals four. Here's why you count one, two, three, four. You got two over here. You add another two. That's four. Doesn't work like that in law school. It's like, all right, well, what's the, uh, what's the value of counting? Hmm. What are the ways that you can count? Are there any tools that you could use to do that counting? Okay. How about you? Do you have any tools? Well, what do you think about his tools over there? And you go, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Grueler, Harry, Sam, Jennifer. What do you think about his interpretation of that? What's the importance of addition? And what can you do? What are the consequences of that? What if we all added on a daily basis? Would society fall apart? Well, what do you think, Mr. Johnson? Right? And it's that style of, of learning. And then eventually somebody says, well, we need, you know, I think we need uh, addition because it's important for our economy and people can't do business if they can't add things. And I go, oh yeah, see. So turn your pages to page 47. That's where justice, whatever said that. And he goes through and it's this old language from 200 years ago that nobody understands. And you go, oh, okay. So addition's good. Great. That's the Socratic method. And it's pretty valuable. It, it's, it, it's a good exercise for your brain. It's not just reading and regurgitating facts and they want to drive that out of you. It's annoying. It's very frustrating, but it's pretty good. And you get a lot of that in law school. So this guy was trying to do the same thing. You use the Socratic method to lead discussion in his course on political philosophy. While using that method, he addresses his students as Mr. or Miss, which is exactly what happened in law school because he believes his formal manner of addressing students helps them view the academic enterprise as a serious weighty endeavor. And it fosters an atmosphere of seriousness and mutual respect. He has found that addressing students in this fashion is an important pedagogical tool in all of his classes, but especially in political philosophy, where hearing the students discuss many of the most controversial issues of public concern. In that first class, he, uh, students Meriwether called on was Doe, one of the first in the first class. According to Meriwether, no one would have assumed that Doe was female based on Doe's outward appearances. Thus, when Meriwether responded to a question from Doe by saying, yes, sir, this was Meriwether's first time meeting Doe and the university had not provided Meriwether with any information about Doe's sex or gender identity. So, I mean, I can, you know, this happened a, 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 a thousand times in law school. Raise your hand. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Right. Because you got a, you got a, a big class of people. You don't know everybody's name. Yes, sir. What do you? Yes, sir. You in the back. That's exactly what happened here. Yes, sir. Raise your hand. Yes, sir. No idea what that, what that person's gender was. After class, Doe 
approached Meriwether and demanded that Meriwether, quote, refer to Doe as a woman and use feminine titles and pronouns. This was the first time that Meriwether learned that Doe identified as a woman. First time. So Meriwether paused before responding because his sincerely held religious beliefs prevented him from communicating messages about gender identity that he believes are false. He explained that he wasn't sure if he could comply with Doe's demands. Doe became hostile, circling around Meriwether at first and then approaching him in a threatened manner. Quote, I guess this means I can call you a C word. That is not ladylike behavior, by the way. Not at all. That word, not appropriate. So uh, Doe here says, I guess this means I can call you a C word. Doe promised that Meriwether would be fired if he did not give in to Doe's demands. Meriwether then reported the incident to the university officials, including the dean. They informed everybody of it. Office Officials from the office met with Doe. They escalated Doe's complaint to Robert Milliken, acting dean of college. Milliken went to Meriwether's office the next day. She advised that he, quote, eliminate all sex-based references from expression. No using he, she, him, or her. No Mr., Mrs., and so on. Meriwether pointed out that eliminating pronouns altogether was next to impossible, especially when teaching. So he proposed a compromise. He would keep using pronouns to address most students in class, but would refer to Doe using only Doe's last name. Dean Milliken accepted this compromise, apparently believing it followed the university's gender identity policy. So the dean of students and his department chair, Jennifer Polly, Robert Milliken is the acting dean of college arts and sciences, which is presumably where the philosophy department is. So Dean Milliken comes over, agrees. Doe continued to, again, to, to attend, so the, the student comes back to attend, participate in Meriwether's class. Doe remained dissatisfied and two weeks into the semester complained to university officials again. So Dean Milliken paid Meriwether another visit. This time, she said, if Meriwether did not address Doe as a woman, he would be violating the university's policy. So rather than saying Mrs. Doe, he's just saying, hey, Doe. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, madam. Yes, gentle sir. Doe, what do you got? Doe, you're up. What do you think about that? Soon after, Meriwether accidentally, oh, damn it, referred to Doe using the title Mr., before immediately correcting himself. Around this time, Doe again complained to the university's Title IX coordinator, threatened to retain counsel if the university didn't take action. So Dean Milliken once again came to Meriwether's office. She reiterated her earlier demand and threatened disciplinary action if he didn't comply. Trying to find common ground, Meriwether asked whether the university's policy would allow him to use students' preferred pronouns, but placed a disclaimer in his syllabus, noting that he was doing so under compulsion and setting forth his personal and religious beliefs about gender identity. Dean Milliken rejected this option out of hand. Yeah, because it would be it would be embarrassing to your employers. She insisted that putting a disclaimer itself would violate the gender identity policy. During the rest of the semester, Meriwether called on Doe using Doe's last name. And according to somebody, Doe displayed no anxiety, fear, or intimidation while attending class. In fact, Doe excelled, participated as much or more than any other student in the course. At the end of the semester, Meriwether awarded Doe a high grade. This grade reflected Doe's very good work and frequent participation in class discussions. Isn't that a happy ending? Isn't that nice? <laughs> Here we go. As semester proceeded, Meriwether continued to search for accommodation of his personal and religious views that would satisfy the university. Shawnee State was not willing to compromise. After Dean Milliken's final meeting with Meriwether, she sent him a formal letter reiterating her demand, address Doe in the same manner, quote, as other students who identify themselves as female. And they have this cited here. The letter said if he did not, the university may conduct an investigation. He would be subject to informal or formal disciplinary action. So they, they gave him a threat, a formal disciplinary action threat. Then just a few days later, and without waiting for a response from Meriwether, Milliken announced that she was initiating a formal investigation. Yeah, so this lady has no idea what she's doing. She claimed that she was doing so because she received another complaint from a student in Meriwether's class. The complaint was again from Doe. Meriwether asked whether an accommodation might be possible given his sincerely held beliefs. Milliken shot him down, said just have two options. Stop using all sex-based pronouns in referring to students, a practical impossibility that would alter the pedagogical environment in the classroom, or refer to Doe as a female, even though doing so would violate his beliefs. So both those sound pretty, uh, pretty not okay for him, right? You're somebody who says, I have a 
religious belief. I know there are people watching out there going, it's just a pronoun, who cares? Well, the problem is it's connected to somebody's deeply held, sincerely held religious belief. And that's important. It may not be important to you, but it's important to other people who have those religious beliefs. It's not just a joke. These aren't people just walking around just going, well, I'm just not going to call somebody by their pronouns because it makes me feel good because I'm an a-hole and I like to be pejorative to people and call them the wrong pronouns. Right? I'm not getting the sense from this guy at all. I'm getting the sense from this guy that he wants to have some real conversations and he has a sincere religious belief. You might disagree with it, but he does have that. And he is trying to facilitate a conversation in a class that has some very documented benefits in the Socratic method. It's something that is commonplace across this, this country. I went through it in law school for three years. I'm sure many other people who watch the show did. Liberty or death is probably right in the middle of it right now because it happens all the time. It's the Socratic method. And so now what's happening is the, the school is coming back and saying, no, you can't conform to any of those rules. You have to follow our rules. And one of those options for you, it's to alter the nature of your entire classroom. You can just stop with the using names. So you can't use Mr. or Mrs. So that would require the professor then to know everybody's name. I don't know how big these classes are. Maybe that's a, that's a feasibility. Okay, if you've got 400 kids in a class, then that's not going to happen. A lot of universities do, but this is a small university. So maybe this is a small class. And rather than going around every to every student and saying, Grueler, Cummings, whatever, right? You use the, the, the nice term, the polite term, Mr. Grueler. Hey, Mr. Grueler. Yes, Mr. Grueler. Yes, Ms. Johnson. Yes, Ms. Smith. Yes, Ms. Harry. Okay. In this case, they're saying you got to change the entire structure of how you do your classes to get rid of that. So that, that doesn't make, make much sense as, as being a professor or just, just violate your religion. Just get rid of those, just do things that are directly contrary to your religion. Both are pretty bad options. Dean Milliken referred the matter to the state's Title IX office. Over the coming months, university Title IX staff conducted a less than thorough investigation. They interviewed just four witnesses, Meriwether, Doe, and two other transgender students. They did not ask Meriwether to recommend any potential witnesses. So he's unrepresented. And aside from Doe and Meriwether themselves, none of the witnesses testified about a single interaction between the two. Nobody even saw any of this. Shawnee State Title IX office concluded that Meriwether's disparate treatment had created a hostile environment. In violation of the policy, they prohibit discrimination, and they define hostile education environment as, quote, any situation in which there is harassing, that, uh, harassing conduct that limits, interferes with, or denies educational benefits or opportunities from both a subjective, the complainants, and an objective, reasonable person's viewpoint. Now, they're trying to get very clever. All right, so that's how they're going to be defining this. They're saying that Doe perceives themselves as a female. Meriwether has refused to recognize that identity by using the pronouns. He's engaged in discrimination and created a hostile environment, even though got good grades, participated a lot, and nobody else could even witness any of these problems. This turned into a problem. The report did not mention Meriwether's request for an accommodation based on his sincerely held religious beliefs. So we don't know if they were going to give him an accommodation or not. After Title IX report issued, Dean Milliken informed Meriwether that she was bringing a formal charge against him under the faculty's collective bargaining agreement. She then issued her own report setting forth her findings. She says, quote, because Dr. Meriwether repeatedly refused to change the way he addressed Doe in his class due to his views on transgender people, and because of the way he treated Doe was differently from the way he treated others in class, he effectively created a hostile environment for Doe. The whole explanation of how Meriwether violated the policies spanned just one paragraph. Finally, to create a safe educational experience for all students, Milliken concluded that it was necessary to discipline Meriwether. She recommended placing a formal warning in his file. Obviously, he was not happy about that. So he is suing. Provost Jerry Bauer was tasked with a disciplinary recommendation. He wrote them a letter saying he treated them all the same. He began referring to them as pronouns. He asked Provost Bauer to allow reasonable minds to differ on this newly emerging cultural issue. He approved the recommendation of formal disciplinary action. So he got disciplined. They placed a written warning in his file. The warning reprimanded him and directed him to change the way he addresses transgender students. So uh, further corrective actions might mean 
suspension without pay, termination, along with any other possible punishments. Then they, uh, the, the union filed a grievance on the professor's behalf, on behalf. So the unions now are actually leading this. They want them to vacate the disciplinary proceedings. They want to allow Meriwether to keep speaking in a manner consistent with his beliefs. Provost Bauer, who already rejected Meriwether's claim once, decided the grievance. So this go, he, he denied the grievance. All right, so that's all about the union. Officials agreed that his conduct had not created a hostile educational environment, but they, re they recommended against ruling against him anyways. Yeah, because it, it's not about that, right? It's not about creating a hostile or a good environment. It's about conforming with the, the, the new way of communication. This guy didn't want to play that game. He got an onslaught of his own version of harassment in the form of you know, corrective actions and, and things like that. Decided, I've had enough of it. The end, that was the end of the grievance process. So the grievance process goes away. He now fears he's going to be fired or suspended. Originally, I thought that that might be overblown, but it's pretty clear that they're just papering their file with this, right? They're, they're sort of building up a cachet of all sorts of things that they can use to, to say, we've tried to, to remedy this. We've told this guy over and over, hey, you know, do one of these two things. He's refusing to do it. Therefore, when they fire him, it's his fault for violating their policies. They tried to go through remediation. They tried to rehabilitate this man, but he was just refusing to cooperate. So they had no choice but to fire him. So he sues before that happens and for good cause, because that was probably the next thing that was coming down the pike. The warning in the letter, uh, the warning letter that they put in his file is going to make it difficult for him to get a job. And then we go into some analysis here. Universities have been fierce guardians of intellectual debate. So they're citing this case once again from the Sixth Circuit. Here, Professor argues that the application of its gender identity policy violated the First Amendment. Court said, Professor speech in the classroom is never protected by the First Amendment. We disagree. Under controlling Supreme Court and Sixth Circuit precedent, First Amendment protects academic speech of university professors. So that is within the bounds of the First Amendment. Since Merriweather has plausibly alleged that they violated his First Amendment rights, his free speech claim may proceed. All right. As a result, our court has rejected totally unpersuasive the argument that teachers have no First Amendment rights when teaching and the government can censor teacher speech without restriction. They're referencing this Sixth Circuit case that they decided in 2001 from Hardy versus Jefferson. So professors have rights. In reaffirming this conclusion, they join other circuits, Fourth, Fifth, and the Ninth Circuits that left open the questions whether they retain academic freedom rights under the First Amendment. It concluded the rule announced does not apply in the academic context of public university. Fifth Circuit said that speech is constitutionally protected as well, saying that academic freedom is of special concern for the First Amendment, which is right. Shawnee and the state said, now they disagree. They said that we should not apply the Supreme Court academic, freezing, uh, uh, ac academic freedom cases because the court has not overruled other cases. They argue that even if there is an academic freedom exception, it does not protect Meriwether's use of titles and pronouns in the classrooms. So you have free speech in the classrooms, but not for pronouns and titles. They say that the use of pronouns has nothing to do with academic freedom interest in the substance of classroom instruction, but that is not true. Any teacher will tell you choices about how to lead a classroom discussion shape the content of the instruction enormously. That is especially true here because Meriwether's choices touch on gender identity, a hotly contested issue and a, a matter of concern that often comes up during class discussion. Forbidding him from describing his views on gender identity, even in the syllabus, would silence a viewpoint that could have catalyzed a robust and insightful in-class discussion. Under the First Amendment, the mere dissemination of ideas on a state university campus may not be shut off in the name alone of conventions of decency. Look at that. It's a powerful case. That is a pure curium opinion. Rather, the lesson of Pickering and the court's academic freedom decisions that the state may only do so when its interest in restricting a professor's in-class speech outweighs his interest in speaking. So they got to do a little bit of a balancing test there. I'm going to fly through some of the rest of this as first, the alleged basis for disciplining Meriwether was a moving target, which is why it's not appropriate. So he doesn't even know what he's violating. It's a moving target. They said the case was about disparate treatment. But at oral argument, the university changed its position once again. It said this is really a hostile environment case, right? So what are they even mad about? What do they want him to do here? What are they trying to remedy with this solution? They didn't even know, right? And we saw that from the dean. Dean Milliken came into his own office and said, all right, uh, you want to call her Doe? It's fine to call her Doe. I don't care. 
They go on to the net, you know, complains again, complains again, complains again. So this guy's trying to work out an accommodation with them, but they're not having it until they just say, all right, enough already. We're just going to discipline this guy. Second, the university policy on accommodations was a moving target. Why does it matter? Because when individualized exemptions from a general requirement are, are available, the government, quote, may not refuse to extend that system to cases of religious hardship without a compelling reason. Milliken told the professor that he was violating it. How he would address Doe using the last name and refrain from using pronouns. She accepted the accommodation, but then retracted it. This about face permits a plausible inference that the policy only the policy allows accommodations, but the university won't provide one here. Title IX investigation raises several flags on their own. These issues might not warrant an inference on non-neutrality, circumstantial evidence. They're also saying it's unconstitutionally vague as applied to him because you don't know what conduct is prohibited allows for arbitrary and discriminatory enforcement. So there's going to be a lot of this surrounding the, uh, the pronouns. How, how do you manage implementation of it? How do you manage violations of it? So in this case, if he says, yes, sir, or did you see that video about that person? Uh, it was a, it was a male to female individual, I think in a game store, uh, screaming at the, at the court clerk, it's a viral video that went around, I don't know, maybe a year ago. And he says, uh, sir, accidentally, right? Cause this, cause this person has the physique of a man because they are a biological male and they were in a store upset about something. And he's trying to have a conversation with him. He says, sir, calm down. And the, and the guy Rrr! female, obviously but unhappy about it. Right? And you just, you just, your mind just says, so what happens in a classroom when that accidentally happens? What, what do you do? Yes, sir. Uh, darn it. I know you identify as female. Uh, I'm going to self-discipline myself. I'm going to evacuate this classroom. I'm going to go sit in my little corner with my woke dunce hat on for uh, being so offensive in the classroom. What do they do? Right. It's, it's sort of arbitrary. And you can see here that the schools themselves don't know how to handle these policies, which is why Dean Milliken comes back into his office and says, hey, if you just stop, if you just call her, call her by the last name, that's sufficient. He does that. Sorry, that's not sufficient because that wasn't satisfying to the student, apparently. So you get all these multiple people involved. And if you don't know what conduct is prohibited because the rules are not clear for you, that's a constitutional problem because then you have people who can come and, and, penalize you, punish you for violating rules. But if you didn't know what the rules are, then they're punishing you over something that you had no proper notice about. That's a due process violation. Now, ignorance of the law is no excuse, but uh, I would say application of the law, if it is arbitrary and capricious, if it allows for arbitrary and discriminatory implementation, that is a constitutional problem. So it goes on. It, it, it goes through the, the rest of that analysis there. Meriwether also failed to argue the policy allowed for argument, uh, arbitrary and discriminatory, uh, discriminatory enforcement. His conclusory assertion that the policy gives officials unbridled discretion and enforcement does not cut it. And to the extent that he developed a point a bit more in his reply, reply brief. OK, so that fails. So they're, they're actually not finding him that the, that, the, the, that the university's policy was, in fact, arbitrary and discriminatory. So they're not saying it's unconstitutionally vague, but he wins on the other merits. So let's take a look at some questions over from locals.com at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. First one comes in from wise one says, what happens when a 16 year old says they identify as a 21 year old? So, or it's so he can buy an adult beverage. We are supposed to ignore science then. Well, I mean, if they feel like a 21 year old, who are you to tell them that they are not a 21 year old? You know, this stuff is, is, is getting to the point of absurdity. You know, a guy I follow, huge fan of his, uh, Scott Adams. He is a white guy, uh, was a white guy. He is now a black man. He has, he has identified as a black man and you can't argue with that. You know I mean? If you can just sort of identify one, if you, if you feel that you are, are something, you should just identify that way. And he's, he's identifying that now as a, as a black male. So Scott Adams, uh, formerly a Caucasian man, is now African-American male, a black male. And yesterday on his uh, podcast, he was talking about some of his brothers out there in society. I forget who he was talking about, but you know, he's sort of expanded his social network pretty, pretty massively by 
changing how he identifies. So I think we're going to see a lot more of that. And, uh, and quite frankly, it might, might be a good decision. So maybe something you want to think about. We have underscore shade says, you'd think there would be science issue cases in school on these gender arguments. Isn't that, there, isn't that where they learn there are two genders, biological? Yes or no? I don't, I don't even know. I mean, honestly, I don't even know where the, 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 the science interplay with these topics. I thought science, you know, that the, the, we are the party of science, that we're only going to talk about science. I thought that only applied to certain arguments. So like if you're talking about COVID, then you just say science all day, science, 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 put the mask on, put the mask, put two masks on, science, 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 science. But if you're talking about gender identity, science is verboten. You do not, what, is, what does science have to do with anything? Okay, it's a subjective interpretation. It's how you feel internally. Things like chromosomes and XY and XX and that type of stuff, that's it's not relevant for that conversation. That stuff's relevant for the COVID conversations, but not for the gender identity conversation. And uh, obviously, if you don't get that, well, I, 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 I can't explain it to you. I can't, it's not explainable. So you have to get an answer from somebody else. <laughs> News Now Wyoming says, are you going to cover the bill that says no biological males can play in female sports if they see themselves as female? I believe in South Dakota. So um, I don't know if it's a good bill. I'll cover it. I haven't I haven't heard about that one yet. I think we're going to see a lot of those coming down the pike. So at some point I'll be covering something in that wheelhouse. I'm sure I think we've already talked about it. I think did we talk about Christy Nome from South Dakota. I don't know if we did. I think she, I don't know if we did. I can't keep track of this stuff anymore, but, but we'll see. We got Liberty or death in the house says, have you read CP snows? The two cultures. This case reminds me of the book. No, I have not, but I'll add that to the queue there. Liberty or death My I have a, I have a massive queue just, just because it gets added to the queue. doesn't mean I'm going to read it, but I'm going to add it to the queue. It's going to make me feel better about myself because I, at least I have a list of important things to read. It's it's, I sleep better at night knowing, Hey, I got a list. Right. So <laughs> to the list, Jeremy Matrita says not to mention, we can literally create any identity we, we wish on this platform and still learn the same amount, no matter how we choose to identify us. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a free for all, you know, it's kind of, it's interesting. You know, listen, folks, there's a very interesting uh, uh, podcast I was listening to last night. Tim Ferriss had on Bology Srinivasan on his podcast and they were talking about and this. This stuff was way over the head of Tim Ferriss. You could, you could see him just going, what the hell you could, you, you couldn't see him cause it's on audio, but you could hear him going, what the hell are you talking about? And uh, Balaji was talking about a, a more digital world where you don't have to have an identity anymore. You have sort of a suit, a pseudo anonymous pseudo pseudo anonymous, I think is the word persona, an avatar that you have on the internet. And when you do zooms and things like that, you have a filter that blocks off your face, blocks off uh, sort of mute your accent, mute your skin color. You can't see that. So you sort of are this, this, uh, this whittled down blob on a screen and nobody can tell what you sound like, what you look like, how old you are, whether you have an accent, where you came from, what your skin color is, what your gender identity is. None of it. You're just a name. And we value you and decide whether we want to do business with you based on your work product and the value that you bring to the interaction, not about your gender, race, age, country of origin. And that this is going to be trending that way. And with a lot of decentralization and, you know, uh, sort of parallel systems, if we've got a parallel financial system, a parallel literally an internet economy that's based on the back of blockchains with smart contracts and Ethereum and all these different uh, new technologies that are coming. Maybe we just sort of get rid of identities. Okay. You can, you can be, uh, you know, uh, uh, whatever, put whatever alphabets after your identity in, in your bio, what do I, on your Twitter handle? I don't care. Nobody cares. Okay. We care about the, I mean, the, the people, I think the real engines of this country are people who just like to get stuff done. And the people who are knocked off track a little bit by having these conversations about, you know, if I'm in that classroom, I want to learn about philosophy. I don't want to have a conversation about, uh, you know, pronouns and things like that. That's not useful to me in my life at all. Right. And so I know for some people that that might be useful, but 
all right, well, we'll just say we're going to, we're, what if we just strip everybody's identity away from them? And it's all about function rather than it is this woke, interwoven, emotional, you know, everything is subjective. I am the deaf, I define my own reality and everybody has to comport and conform with my reality. That, that it's not going to work. I think that this is all mostly a fad. Sort of like, you know, I wasn't alive in the 70s or the 60s, but, you know, you look at the hippie flowers that were sort of, you know, existing in the 60s and everybody's like, yeah, man, make love, not war, all that stuff, right? I think the, the real uh, engines of society looked at that at, at, at that time and said, okay, whatever, like the, these, these idiots are going to burn that out of their system. That's fine. Make love, not war, whatever. Okay. It's, it's all going to, it's all going to be irrelevant 10 years from now. I think that's where we're at with this woke stuff. Now, it is a lot more per pervasive. They're, they're really trying to ingrain this stuff at every single facet of our lives. And we're seeing that not only in the schools, in this case that we just covered, but we also see it in our military. We see it in our government. We see it in our higher education systems throughout the country. Uh, different employers are now implementing it. So this is going to be something that is a lot less uh, ephemeral than, than what we saw, I think, in the 60s and the 70s. But it is still something that I think the people who are the engines of society, they're just going to look at this as an annoyance. The people who want to de define their lives by their gender identities and by these social, cultural, you know, whatever this is, I can't even, I have a hard time defining it then they can just live in their own little bubble and they can just communicate with themselves, create their space, their safe spaces on clubhouse and other apps and live their world. The rest of us will live ours and that will be an okay thing. So we've got Osak says last question of the day, Rob, does this case fall into or have a point of law of general public importance? Rob, you should use this as a defense that your client refers to being not guilty of anything. <laughs> That's a good point. That's a good point. You know, that's a, it's a, <laughs> it's a good argument. It's actually a great idea. Osak. So that's, that's right. That's what, that's what we're going to do at our, uh, our next opening arguments. We're going to say, uh, you're, uh, we're going to file motions to dismiss in our cases, your honor, our client identifies as a non-criminal. Obviously this entire scheme is to label him something that he's not, as we know, as has already been pointed out to us by people in the judiciary, by people, our politicians, that, you know, your, your identity is what you say it is. If you feel that you are a biological man, even though you're born with uh, female chromosomes and you have female equipment, well, you get to identify that way. And in fact, it, it might even be a Title IX violation. And in fact, Joe Biden and his White House have said that they are going to make some serious modifications to the federal executive government from the executive branch that, that are going to help implement this as law in this country. Therefore, we're identifying as non-criminals and we ask that the case be dismissed. Mr. Gruler, it's a great point. Granted, your client's free. Exonerate the bond, sir, you're free to go. Osak, that's you, my friend, nice job. So he says, does this case have a point of law of general public importance? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's tremendous. Uh, tremendous public importance. Now, what, it, what may end up happening is, so this is, this is precedent, okay? It's not binding across the country. So this is a Sixth Circuit case uh, dis discussed by three judges. They might bring that up back to a full panel. And so the, you know, the full panel might come back down and say, no, nah, we don't agree with that opinion. We're going to modify it a little bit. So it may not be permanent. And it's also only uh, precedential for that circuit. So the lower district courts, they all have to follow that rule unless the full panel on the court of appeals comes back and modifies that or vacates that opinion in that circuit. They all have to follow the rules. Now, outside of the circuit, they can look to the Sixth Circuit opinion and say, uh, look, you know, so say this case comes up in a different circuit, like in Arizona, we're in the Ninth Circuit. We want to point over to the Sixth in Ohio and say, look, this is what they did. They said, Free speech applies in the classroom. If a, if a professor has a sincerely held religious belief and they don't want to use uh, the, 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 what they feel to be the inappropriate gender pronouns, there's case law on point that says that they don't have to do that. And that's not binding here in Arizona because it happened in Ohio under the sixth circuit. They don't have jurisdiction here. The ninth circuit does, but we could say, we could tell the ninth circuit, other circuits have already done this analysis, the same analysis that you're trying to figure out how to handle. They've already done it. And we saw other circuits are in conformity with that. I think the judge referenced the different circuits that have a similar viewpoint. So it's, it's persuasive, but it's not binding. But if you get enough circuits who all sort of fall in line, then practically you have sort of binding precedent around the country, unless the Supreme Court comes in and shakes 
the, the box a little bit and changes the rules. So it's a very good question. Uh, the, the big takeaway from your comment is that now all of our clients, our, our clients already identify as not guilty. That's nothing new, but it's, it's using that as a defense, which I think is quite brilliant. So well done there, Osak. And that was it of the questions for today's show. Long show had to squeeze it in here because I missed you so much. I want to thank all of our local supporters, the people who were supporting us over the weekend. We got chairman of the board. We got Liberty or Death saw him here today. We got Jen McClellan. Who else did we see? Uh, Jack Elias usually in the program. We got Cody Bear. We got Soch. Big thank you to Ma Fox. Haven't seen you or in, in a few days. I've been away. Haven't even seen Miss Faith for a few days. But thank you to you both. Happy to be back. We've got Tawny13. We've got Brother Dave, Office Warrior, Paula MK in the house. We've got Jax842. We've got Aussie Andy. Hello from Australia. We got Lou Walker, See the Veil. All these people are supporting us over on Locals.com. Can you believe this? Look at this list. It just keeps getting bigger. We got News Now Wyoming in the house. Good to have you. Who else? Look at these people. Oh my gosh, I'm so happy. We got so many lovely supporters over there. We got Souls Under Siege. Wow. That's a good band name. Souls Under Siege for a band name. I like that. We have Oil Smoke Jones. Oil Smoke Jones in the house. Welcome. We got Lynn Fish who signed up. Welcome to the program, Lynn. We got JLR1827 signed up. We got Whipple number one. We have FFMORGC. And isn't that a codec? Isn't that an encoder? F-F-M-O-R-G. I think it is. But welcome to the show. We got Uncle Bob's BMW is in the house. Uncle Bob's BMW. Join the program. We're happy that you're all here. Thank you so much for supporting the show. We have a community over on Locals, and I'm working on sort of... uh, on bringing everything together. And so I've got sort of an interesting idea for some of the stuff that we're going to be releasing on, on uh, locals.com. So go check us out over there. It's watching the watchers.locals.com. Get a free copy of my book. As you can see here, get a free copy of the impeachment party documents, get a copy of the existence systems and share some links. Oh, don't forget to download a copy of these slides. If, If you want any of the slides, including any of the videos that we played and links to where we got the sources. They're all in the PowerPoint slides. You can download those over at Locals. Miss Faith and Miss Ma are moderating the, the program over there, so go check that out. The real reason, though, is to meet with some great people, to get plugged into a little bit of a different community, kind of diversify a little bit, you know, in case something happens with YouTube or something like that. So it's a good spot to be. I, I really, It really means the world to me that you, you, you're there, honestly. I mean, it's... it's uh, it's very humbling, and I appreciate it. Thank you for supporting the show. So that takes place over at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. Lastly, but not leastly, I am a criminal defense attorney. You can see our sign right there, the R&R Law Group. We're located in Scottsdale, Arizona. We love to help good people who have been charged with crimes find safety, clarity, and hope in their cases and in their futures. We offer free case evaluation so we can help anybody who's been in trouble with the law in the state of Arizona. So if you know anybody who's facing any type of crime, any criminal charges, domestic violence, DUI, drug offenses, traffic violations, if there's old warrants, old mugshots, old cases that need to be cleaned up, We can help do that. We can help people get their license back if they have old warrants or unpaid fines even. We can help you sort of get oriented on that. Even if you don't hire us, we'll just tell you how to go pay those fines and what to do next. So there's a lot of solutions that you can can start working on in order to sort of get things back to normal. We can also help you restore your rights for voting, possess a firearm again, go apply for federal benefits. In Arizona, We just passed uh, Prop 207 about marijuana, so we can expunge old marijuana cases. We can remove mugshots off the internet. Can you believe that? So there's just a lot that we can do to help. The goal here is to help good people. It's to help things, you know, go go the right way. The justice system can be very harsh. It can be very, very uh, cold and dehumanizing. And so we want to help restore people get things back on track. And we offer free case evaluations. We're very good at what we do. We love the work that we do. We have an awesome team of people here. So if you or anybody that you know or love need some help, we would be honored and humbled if you send them our way. We'll take very good care of them. We'll make sure that they leave better than they came in. That's it for me, my friends. I want to thank you so much for being here today. We're going to hop on Clubhouse here for a little bit. I got about 30 minutes and answer some questions because I, I, I kind of missed everybody and I want to just, uh, I, I want to spend some time saying hello. So if you're on Clubhouse, come check us out. The link is in the description below. Uh, if not, I apologize for that, but they're working on an Android app and that will be out soon. And then we can all be a part of the party. So uh, see you on Clubhouse, everybody. One more reminder, same place, same time. 
tomorrow. Right back here. It's going to be 4 p.m. Arizona time, 4 p.m. in California on the, on the Pacific side of this country, 5 p.m. Mountain time, 6 p.m. Central in Texas, 7 p.m. on the East Coast. And for Florida, man, I'm still getting used to the new time zone since everybody else changes except us. But we're going to be here at the same place, same time. You know what time it is. Everybody have a very lovely week. I hope that you had a, an awesome Monday. We're going to be right back here, ready to go tomorrow. Sleep well, have a nice dinner, and I'll see you then. Bye-bye.